Thank you. Um, let's, stay in, let's stay in the East a little bit longer. That music. Um, a, a friend of mine in Damascus told me that there are 67 words for the word lion. I presume that there may be as many for the word tiger. Um, this is based on a 19th century account of tiger hunting in Syria. It's called Tiger Music. You see that eminence? You shall have your heart's fill of them there. The village elder, almost blind, pointed to a crag floating in distant haze. Thus sped with hope our guns caught, although it never was our purpose to kill, we went looking for tigers. If what the fellaheen said was true, if there was nothing they could not in their language describe, we met not a soul who knew all the words, the more than fifty or so, that speak the many shades of tigerness between one which dozes and another that lunges, the different music they make. All day we watched for movement in the stone. We saw lizards which at our approach slid off like lightning into crevices. A couple of eagles from an eyrie on the crag above wheeled and hovered upon the the shadows like two spots of ink moving upon the mountainside. We watched for tigers but saw none. Although we did see a gazelle, its gashed throat jeweled with flies. Whiteness pooling his eyes, the village elder was confused, or so he appeared. What could have made them go away, he asked. Once I saw tigers everywhere. All night we fought among ourselves. One man said leopards dwelled here, while another lynxes, anything but tigers. Such was the consensus of all but one. The old boy stuck to his guns, of course, warned us of the dangers that come of grabbing tigers by the tail. A snake doubles back upon half its length, he said, whereas a tiger goes it whole. Our dragoman, scoffing at him, said, this was a country as bare of tigers as his soul of truth. So why then, the other replied, if indeed there are none, should our language have 50 or more words for the many moods they strike? We drank our bitter coffee, and discussing what provisions we should take, said tomorrow perhaps would see the settlement of our dispute as to what those famous tigers really were. It's a poem called Sparrow, which is based on fact. The bitch muse has gone, pulled another fast one. She knows better than you what makes things shake. She has taken even the electric blanket and the ice cube maker. The silver spoon in which she cooks her substances. She paints her fingernails blue. A small space between her front teeth is so irresistible she becomes second wife to a thousand men, none of whom realizes he is not her only one. You should have known better than to bring her home. You should never have tried to work miracles on a global scale. There are, after all, limits to what a man on stilts can do. 
You bagged for yourself only history's brighter plumage. It is time now to make amends, apologize for the massacre that took place one cloudless afternoon when Stone Age became Bronze Age. When all talk was of modification to arrow structure and of wind velocity and how things would never again be quite the same. Still, those old iniquities put your daily ones in the shade. They are not without their uses. You are contrite, remember? Squeeze just enough juice from the eyes. Go on, twitch a little. The masses will swoon at your side. Easy now. Otherwise, you will pay a heavy price for what you pretend not to be, a surly lout who burps the ghost of an evening's beer. A mothballed ghost rises to your skull's center. Slowly you turn the pages of a book stippled with white spores. What the words do is make you see crazy pictures. A man cools his face against a pillar of rose marble. Seven yellow wasps nuzzle a bowl of green grapes. A Babylonian chorus cries, if a man fails at what he loves, God forbid he should succeed at what he hates. The actors dropping their masks reveal themselves for what they always were, ordinary folk who could not resist the pull of the stage. You never noticed them as you should have in life. Superannuated, they go to their summer cottages, calm stations between what never was or will ever be. She's gone too, who wore rings in strange places, cold her eyes and asked in a husky voice what your pleasure was. All you could do, perfect fool, was bite your tongue. Meanwhile, the sun's a broken yoke at the city's edge. One by one, the lights flicker on and the couple opposite gesticulate with their pizza slices, as if in some dumb ballet that you yourself choreograph as you watch and puzzle at what goes on between other creatures. You wonder too, where have all the sparrows gone? I did something completely bonkers. I missed out a page of the poem because it, uh, it folds in such a curious way. And I'm a bit nervous, so you'll never hear the, the missing page. Uh, the, the publication is unavailable. I'll try to read all of this poem. It's called Dr. Honoris Causa. I should have seen the beard in the cradle. And had my shepherd's breath raked your smooth face, I might have caught beyond those warbled sounds you made, the terrible exact sentences they would become. Should I have pressed the pillow to your voice. I was your teacher once. I taught you to see in the dark of ignorance the shapes which certain words make and those words too with which men who have something to hide sheathe meaning with mire. I could not abide the way you handled a blade. Yet glad I was when you moved with guile against your foes. Who would not be proud to serve a boy who could bend with ease the bow of language? We knew beauty once, 
and we huddled close against the damp aching through our bones. You learned to look deeply into the landscape so that any sudden movement there would make your soul vibrate. It is said you credit me with all this and more. On a day more January than June, coldness where warmth should be, I pull the blind of the swaying crowd outside. The wind blows your speech about like a newly wrapped bundle. You strangle the populace with your love. The orphans in the street follow you home. You may be shot, I still breathe. A strange kingdom it is where only the dead win prizes. You should have honored me with silence. I send you the address where I live. A blackbird sings outside. If civilization is to be, we must have slaves. Another voice speaks through the cold Assyrian stone. The same words you spoke in Rome, Moscow, Albuquerque. It hardly matters from what place they come. The consonants of power remain the same. Suddenly we burst upon that scene. A warm day beside the Euphrates, the mood, the mood festive and perhaps a little too forced to be wholly true. A procession of musicians strums guitars and lyres. It could just as easily be the Thames or the Yangtze. We squeeze narrowly between boredom and pleasure. A young boy is perched astride a wooden cage, a lion milling back and forth beneath him, and death being close sends a message of ice through the boy's testicles. A serious joy is to be had here. We find the alabastrine marble somehow remote. And this chariot bringing on this other bearded voice is of a world too soaked with blood to revere. There is only this youth we know from somewhere. A pale boy in Albuquerque siphons the sun through a broken bottle. A young peasant visits Moscow for the first time. We find them again flapping card in Rome. A signal is made, and the boy waiting for a king's eyes to meet his pulls the release. A couple of horsemen, ancient picadors, spear the lion towards the chariot's blinding noise. A wall of soldiers bearing high shields blocks all hope of escape. An arrow flies and will always fly across the stone. Another arrow pierces the lion's shoulder and another the lion's spine. As though smelling of the high grape, the beast with stunned eyes delve space, but the air is too solid to probe any more. The man who commits into stone these final agonies makes sure they are as finely carved as the ringlets in the beard of the king who burns alive the children of his enemies. The sculptor faithful to what he sees will always be at a distance from what he serves. A hardened pity makes these walls breathe. The boy watches the king pour a libation of wine over the lion's corpse. A weeping boy smashes his balalaika against a tree. A tourist in a via sacra finds his wallet gone. A small pile of twigs and leaves begins to flame. If civilization is to be, you shall know the humble old Blake painted your relative crawling on his hands and knees. Smoke hangs above the tumbled brick which housed your throne. 
Where can I find you absolutely alone? And by alone, I mean disencumbered of that solitude which comes of being in charge. Alone as wolves are alone, and only in those silences which are purely mine will we speak through the straight and narrow of love. The hour is late, the spade's edge sparks upon stone. I hear that you regularly poison your slaves. You will accuse me of being overly figurative, and already you think to cure me with a doctorate, a pension scheme, and a gold watch, which is of no use when for me only the blackbird singing in the branches is time. It's a universe all rusty fishhooks and spiritual collapse. We must play our games in the absence of rules. The journey begun in disburdened light stops here amid a heap of broken glass, distorted facts, prescriptions of all colors and sizes. We shall wear paper crowns if need be. So what do you suppose had become of me while you were busy shaking the virgins from their trees? The smell of greatness must have been too much upon me, for I was sent packing from village to village, shore to shore. There was no place so remote I could not find your smiling features plastered everywhere appealing icons sunned to pale greens and blues. A valley of ghosts became my abode, and still I sang your praises, thinking you might summon me from the vaults where even now my brothers and sisters hide. Yes, I saw my own dying down there. When finally I returned home, nobody would speak my name. My scribbled notes were used to keep mice in their holes and the wind from coming inside. I spent evenings following the moon upon the face of a river so old it could remember nothing, no, not even the king's woes chronicles I pushed into rhyme. Who should know such neglect and be? If ever you should make the journey here, I will show you those few things which I call mine. You will remind me that once I told you nothing can ever be mine, and I will thank you for so kindly restoring to me my own tongue. We must allow ourselves these solemn courtesies since anything else that can be destroyed, you already have. Say then that I am slave to these several pleasures which I find hardest to release. I have nothing else which you can remove. This astrolabe a blind merchant sold me. The man who made this table could neither read nor write, and yet he could converse in the hidden language of trees. I could heap the world upon this table. A philosopher who can barely hold his wine tells me my wooden chair may not be here. A phantom supports me. This bed is sunken only to my own shape. I could never speak of love, although I mocked in verse its parlance once or twice. I must tell you that I loved what was not mine to love, the mother of a certain pupil of mine. A wild hyena stoked her eyes. These books are prisons waiting for you or anyone else to set the words inside them free. I must ask that you handle my pen with care. Will you sentence this pen, which obeys no hand but mine? 
This narrow room is borrowed out of time. I shall, if you allow me, remain here. Thank you.